This conference will now be recorded. Yes, so welcome to this CLAF webinar and I'm delighted to introduce um, Russell Bowman who's going to give us a, a talk today on um, the new Syria UXO guidance. Um, but I'll introduce him properly in a wee minute. Um, our next webinar after this is going to be on the 1st of October. And um, just get my information about this. So yeah, 1st of October. And we're going to have a presentation from Shona Glenn of the Scottish Land Commission. Um, Shona is going to present the findings of the um, Vacant Derelict Land Task Force's um, work um, and the recommendations that are going to government on that. So the report's due to be published at the end of the month, hopefully. Um, and I thought that since I've already done, I think, three presentations for SCLAF on the Vacant and Derelict Land Task Force, I would maybe get Shona to do one for a, for a wee change. So, um, so she'll be joining us in the first. We do have a number of other um, presentations lined up. Um, I think there's another four in the diary. Um, but some of you who maybe follow on LinkedIn would have saw my sort of idea to have a sort of how-to series of webinars. Um, along the lines of sort of like how to investigate a gas works, how to investigate a steel works, whatever. So if you have any thoughts on the types of industries or sectors or, or topics that you would um, like to be included in that series, then pop them in the chat or drop us a wee email. That would be great. Um, so um, as you know, um, all of our speakers are invited to nominate a charity um, for um, their participation in the webinar. Um, Russell today has um, has not nominated a charity, but has asked you to consider giving blood instead. So I'll be putting some information about that in the chat in a wee minute. Um, so I think that's all I've got to say. We've got quite a few people on the call now. So um, without further ado, I'll just introduce Russell. So um, Russell's worked in the site investigation and remediation sector for 15 years. 15, that wasn't 50. Um, who is the lead author on Syria's new guidance on unexploded ordnance for land-based projects. Um, and apparently it was an idea that was put to him by an international UXO expert whilst rushing for a train. Now, I don't know if he's going to expand on that in his presentation, but I'm sure we're all um, keen to hear that story. Um, he's also working to promote design-focused thinking within the sector. And so without further ado, I'll just hand over to you, Russell. Thank you, Alison, and good morning, everybody. Um, just need to apologise in advance. Um, I'm just getting over a cold, so the, the talk may be interspersed with a few uh, coughing fits, um, but um, I think that's perhaps something that we're sort of getting accustomed to nowadays. Um, so yeah, unexploded ordnance um, and what's changed in 10 years. Um, that 10 years, as I'll come on to touch on within the talk, is the time time between Syria's original guidance um, and this, this new guidance, C785, um, that I was uh, had the pleasure to be lead author on. So moving on, um, I thought it would be useful um, to just have a touch base on exactly what unexploded ordnance is. Um, for those of you who are not so familiar with the subject, quite sort of technically and bluntly, um, it's a device, an explosive device that has failed to function as intended. Um, and it sort of put that in there first off because I think it sort of really sort of sets the scene about um, with, with regards to the nature of the hazard that we're dealing with. Um, it's quite a cold definition that. It's also referred to as unexploded bombs. Um, I mean, it, it can be used interchangeably, but there is a distinction. Un ordnance is a broad term for all sorts of munitions. Um, and, and weapons within some military circles. Bombs are, are typically those that which are uh, sort of aerially dropped. Um, but again, the terms can be used interchangeably. International circles tend to use explosive remnants of war as a, a again, a, a broader catch-all definition for the term. These pictures here that I'm showing you are just some examples. Um, I've sort of chosen from, from different time periods, different parts of the world. The image on the left there is, is an, uh, an image of a, uh, an unexploded bomb in the UK, a fairly recent example of a, a clearance operation. Top right, I think that's um, the Red Crescent um, operatives sort of talking to people about, or to, sort of talking to school children rather, about the dangers of ordnance in, um, in obviously post-war or active war zone. And again, it's sort of, I think 
I included that just to give again give you a flavour of the fact that this this is not a hazard, um, this is not a legacy issue that's unique to the United Kingdom. And then that bottom right photo there is uh, again, it, I think it gives you a flavour of how tolerances for risk have changed over time, but I, as I understand that's taken from the Wikipedia entry for the bombardment of Hartlepool um, and the East Coast during the First World War, and that's an unexploded shell that's been fired across from a German destroyer. Um, so yeah, well, well, so why, why do we have a legacy of UXO? Um, well, we have been and continue to be a highly militarised nation and that's a figure there of 20%, roughly 20% of UK soil, having at some point been put to military land use, be that training operations or actual bases. Um, we've also got the, so the legacy of the First and Second World Wars, um, aerial drop munitions. First World War, we had Zeppelin uh, raids and in the Second World War, you may be more familiar with the Luftwaffe raids, um, the Blitz. I should point out that those blue texts there are hyperlinks to, uh, to different web, web resources for anyone who's wishing to kind of look into the subject a little bit more in, in detail. Those hyperlinks don't appear to be working on the, on the PDF, so I've included them at the end of the presentation, um, and you can browse those at your leisure. Um, I, I would point out, though, at this point, that this subject is um, and one of the, 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 the tricky. The tricky thing with this subject is is a very in, in interesting subject, and I think it can really draw you in. And so, as so, operatives who are dealing with sort of ground hazards in the round um, just need to be sort of mindful of that um, because yeah, it can really take you in. There's such a sort of rich history to it. So finish off those bullet points there, yeah, we had the sea to land bombardment, as I mentioned, on the East Coast during the First World War. Um, and, and then finally, there, that point that the legacy varies from country to country. And um, that, that link there, again, it takes you to the, the Wikipedia entry for unexploded ordnance, which is, which is, I think, I'd, I'd recommend a quick visit to. And it just really gives a flavour of the, the relative impact that UXO across the world has had from country to country. Again, it's, it's a web it's a web resource. It's, it's not fully authoritative, but again, it gives you a flavour um, of, of how different countries have been affected by this. Um, so, uh, moving on to some more sort of some technical matters. Um, what exactly is the nature of the hazard that UXO presents? Um, well, first off, it's a land-based ground hazard that this guidance is dealing with, I should point out, because in the UK, we do have um, a maritime risk from US, UXO and this is covered within another series of guidance documents um, separate to this. So this is a terrestrial land-based uh, guidance document and so again it, it, onshore as I said on that note there always almost always found in the ground. Rare exceptions less of an issue nowadays where incendiary bombs have been found in the rafters of a house for example. Um, so it's a residual or historic hazard um, and so yeah, it remains with us in the UK and through the passage of time most specifically through development cycles as land is, is processed is churned through um, that hazard is reducing um, in, in the same way that contamination the legacy from our post-industrial era um, is reducing as we develop uh, to develop land significant hazards um, I think that sort of really goes without saying um, that's, as we'll come on to in a second, that has a particular meaning with regards to the regulations um, and um, our sub duties as risk assessors. Um, and so, yeah, as I say, it's, it's designed to kill and still has the potential to. The final point in this section is a background threat. Um, we, we've not had any fa known fatalities in the UK since 1949, which is the sort of end of the clearance operations, roughly, after the Second World War. Um, there, there was and there is cited within the new guidance a uh, incident in Normanton, just outside of Wakefield, where um, there was a, some detonators um, resulted in the fatality of one, I think, banksman working with an, uh, an excavator. And that um, th that site was co-opted, as you might imagine, during the war for the war effort. Um, but it it's, it's not clear as to whether or not those detonators were UXO related or quarry blasting related it's, it's almost semantics but I thought I'd, for completeness would mention that and that took place in the 1980s. 
UXO, what is the likelihood of encountering UXO? Obviously, this is going to feed, it's a key factor within our sort of risk assessment process. And the real point here is it really varies across the land areas. I've included again a, another link there to a to a sort of an enthusiast's website who has been sort of looking to sort of get some semblance of a coordinated record of UXO sort of clearance operations. Again, it is by no means complete and authoritative, but it gives you a flavour of the number of incidents that are occurring. Um, and okay, again, I'll come on to this point again because it's so key. Right, so so why are we assessing the risk? Um, well, as sort of advisors, anyone in an advisory position, we've got duties and responsibilities, um, foremostly under the Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations, where UXO is listed, oh, sorry, rather, UXO is not listed. Um, significant hazards need to be assessed. Um, and again, this comes back to that earlier sort of definition of the, of, of the term. Um, similarly, within CDM, sort of a more recent sort of guidance document, uh, which is still un enforceable under law, uh, but I would, would say the Management so Health and Safety at Work, or rather the Health and Safety at Work Act, which we'll come on to shortly, is is an actual act of law, whereas the, the CDM is obviously of regulations, but it, it's still um, admissible under law. Foreseeable risks, significant hazards, and emergency response are all terms that are used within the latest iteration of the CDM guidance, which all relate to UXO. Um, and so I've taken out those those key terms there to just kind of again to reinforce the point that as it's a significant hazard, as it's something that we should be foreseeing, it needs to be engaged with. Uh, which is so moving on back. So commercially, again, you, you get if you're to encounter responsibly UXO on a project, you're talking about shutting down a construction site um, and all the so preliminary costs associated with that. Another point, the land value, um, which is something that's not often sort of cons so well considered, um, is if you were to buy some cheap military land, for example, and I know the uh, Department of uh, the DOI, um, DIO rather, Defence in Infrastructure Organisation, are going through a process of, uh, of land sales, um, and you can you can buy former military land. These, as we'll come on to, uh, are have a particular risk risk profile or an increased likelihood of UXO being present um, and that is something as part of any transactional work that we might do that we need to be mindful of and and then finally that any knowledge um, and I think this goes for any anything in the ground any knowledge is, is, is of value and so um, if you have done a UXO risk assessment for parts of land that is part of a part of a package of information that you have on that ground and finally, there the legal case history. Um, we've we've got, as far as we're aware, uh, none were reported to us during the process of pulling the guidance together. No known legal cases relating to UXO. So, um, so look, as I said, the talk, this talk is sort of couched in in a in a, in a time frame um, term. So let's have a look at the, the timeline of UXO risk management. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the last known. Um, UXO related fatality was in 1949. Um, the Health and Safety at Work Act, which is confusing with the Management of Health and Safety at Work regs, comes in in 1974. The term, so far as is reasonably practicable, gets introduced um, into to legal um, sort of counts on then. That term is something that we sort of elaborate on in the guidance because um, the term which perhaps we're more familiar with of a LARP or as low as reasonably practicable is a term that's used sort of interchangeably. Um, a LARP is a term that was introduced from the high hazard sector um, to the chemical industry and power sectors where you had to demonstrate that there was, the risk was managed as low as reasonably practicable. In law, we're asked to demonstrate that it is so far as is reasonably practicable and there is a distinction there, and it is all in terms of uh, sort of our engagement and tolerance of risk. Um, and again, that is sort of something that we'll be sort of touching on a bit further in this talk. So moving on, there's yeah, CDM regs in their first iteration came out in 1994. Um, Management of Health and Safety at Work regs, 1999. 
which really sort of fleshed out the Health and Safety at Work Act in more practical terms, um, and it introduced that language that I mentioned earlier about significant hazards. 2007, CDM regs get a revision. 2009, uh, Syria's first guidance on UXO comes out, C681. CDM regs get revised again into the 2015 version that we're currently working with. And then finally, or, or rather, just, just recently, we've got the new new guidance which we're talking on today. So over that time span there, um, I've put these two so very uh, unscientific bars um, at the, bay, the bottom there, which are trying to sort of convey um, risk management responses over that time period. So following on from the war, um, the government have, uh, in the UK at least, a responsive approach to risk management. So if you if a UXO is encountered in the grounds, um, a, a grenade in, in sort of granddad's shed um, is, is uncovered, then um, the government, or rather the, the military, will sort of scrambled out to site after the police have escalated it to them and they will clear it. What I'm trying to convey there is, again, because it's it's a hazard, or rather it's a, it's a historic hazard, um, the, the number of call-out incidents, again, this will have been decreasing over time um, as cycles of development have, have removed increasing numbers of UXO. That's not to say there isn't still active call-outs, and if you were to look at any Twitter feeds from UXO specialists, um, which I, again is something I would, sort of, what I would suggest you do, you will see large numbers of UXO um, being recovered in UK soil still. Now, I, I, well, 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 so we'll, again, we'll touch on this again later on the talk. Uh, there's a really key point there that you, you look at where those UXOs are encountered because that's a, it's a really key point, again, because it varies across different land uses. And we'll, we'll touch on that again. And then, yeah, at the bottom there, industry and a varied response um, to UXO. Um, I, 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 I've put there that we've had quite a kind of cool response to it historically. Um, where it would have been something that was very much responsive and to call back out to, uh, to military. I think military establishments, again, would have been a bit of an exception to that. More recently, um, I'm sort of suggesting there that it's, it's hotting up a little bit. Um, there's an increasing number of commercial organisations operating in this field. Um, UXO is being, is being considered a lot more on projects. And I think it's in a period of flux overall where We've got um, sort of tolerances for the risk, um, so sort of, sort of being almost negotiated uh, with that time, and and so uh, hopefully our aspiration for this guidance was it was going to um, offer a bit more clarity on that. So crucial question: Why why do we need more U UXO guidance? Um, firstly, um, just to kind of to touch on the, the, the authorship. Um, as as Alison mentioned there at the beginning, I mean, I'm I'm the UK non-UXO specialist there on that list. Um, the international UXO specialist was um, a gentleman called Paul Davies, um, who's worked all across the world for different UXO organisations, also rather doing UXO risk management. Um, and at the time of the guidance, was based in Cambodia, doing some work for the Australian government on infrastructure projects and. Um, and so within that, um, one sort of anecdote that came from one of our earlier conversations was the Australian government was seeking to eliminate the risk of UXO from their projects entirely. Um, and so there was no, inter no, no incidents of UXO fatalities or injuries, e even in fairly high risk areas um, within Cambodia. Um, and yet there were almost week on week, certainly month on month, road accidents or road fatalities um, on the projects and that was again perceived to be a, a tolerable risk whereas the perceived risk of a UXA fatality on the project from a sort of public relations perspective was deemed to have a higher um, or rather the, the, the risk was sought to be eliminated and again I think that's sort of a key point to pause on, um, perhaps just again because um, the risk is influenced by various elements, technical and non-technical, and um, I think that's, it was an interesting example, I thought. And then so finally, a UK 
UXO specialists, the first line defense, um, worked with us on this project. And then finally there, but so most, most importantly, that Syria have, um, they have a, a, a guidance director that works all the way through the project and they assemble a steering group. And so the guidance over four meetings throughout a, a period of a year, we sat down and the guidance was scrutinized uh, thoroughly by the steering group. And so you, you get a, a peer review process. Um, within the new guidance, as I mentioned on that timeline, we've, we've had CDM 2015 come out. And so um, that's been included within the guidance, a small sort of, sort of update there. And there's been some new case studies, there's been some new encounters, and there's some new case studies that we've added to the guidance that we feel adds a bit more context. Much shorter guidance document, almost by half exactly. The target audience is very much geared towards some non-UXO specialists um, and crucially looking at all land scenarios. Um, so trying to expand it out from beyond the construction and development sector and look at just sort of land in, in the round. It sort of clarify the background threat there with some images and I think there's a bit of a, sort of a word that's missing there. There's some media fact checks um, that there's um, there's a lot of misreporting about UXO out there um, at, at various different sort of levels of technical detail. Uh, and then finally, their practical focus, we introduced flowcharts, which we all love to hate, and lots of worked examples and a generic response plan should you encounter suspected UXO. There's also lots of pictures and we'll just take the moment to kind of hold up a, a version of the guidance. It's, it's in an A5 format and hopefully you can, can see that there on my screen. Um, but I just thought to give you a flavor of some of the pictures there of different items. Um, we're sort of keen to stress to people that this isn't an authoritative guide for identification purposes. But again, it just, we, we through our, our day jobs, um, I imagine we find quite a lot of unexpected items in the ground. Um, and we sort of hope that that was going to again give us a bit more of a sort of feel for for what um, suspected UXO might be. And for a final few bullet points here, the HSE worked with us so very closely on this guidance, um, and that was is really valuable sort of input on the project. Um, they aren't able to endorse it, but they worked closely with us on it. The um, I said, the the the, sort of the anecdote that was left with when working the HSC was their greatest concern was a, um, a, 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 a somebody who's new to development buying a cheap piece of former military land and progressing with the development um, regardless of the fact there's a military history associated with it and I've actually seen that a couple of times in my day job um, and or rather sort of acute, seen it acutely or projects that I've not had a chance to be involved with um, and then that's that's where they're most concerned. And in fact, during the process of writing the guidance, there was a case where they were called out to a site of that very, very, very type. And beside police, we sort of spoke to a lot of police authorities who were sort of keen to just kind of get a bit of their sort of input on, on, on their experience of it. Um, and they were really keen to kind of be involved and sort of feed into the guidance. Um, and they liked to see that there was kind of an emergency response plan within the guidance document, so people can at least have some clarity about what to do when the unexpected happens. And then finally, there's so lots of other international specialists who are fed into the guidance. And um, again, as Alison mentioned at the beginning with that, that first chat I had with an international specialist running to the train, um, I, one of the things I was drawn to with this project was working with somebody who wasn't operating in the UK, who could offer a slightly more objective sort of worldview on UXO risk management. Next point there, you see those three bullet points highlighted the target audience, background threat and practical focus. I'm sort of going to those in a little bit more detail over the next few slides. So looking at target audience, um, again, this this image is straight out of the guidance. Um, we're really sort of trying to again, draw people's attention to the fact that risk management is not something that is complete, is, is, uh, exclusive to the construction cycle, um, which you can see there top right, where the REBA work stages will kick in. Um, I should point out all the italicized writing there are points at which risk management is fed into a, a given project or a given parcel of land. 
Um, so yeah, even once we've gone through construction, we've got HSE, uh, health and safety files being passed at all the different stages of a project, management, demolition and vacancy. Um, particularly when you get to vacancy, you'd be doing due diligence um, and transactional work. Again, UXO risk management or risk management in the round can feed into there. How much is this land worth um, and what, what unforeseen have I got um, that might change its value? Clarifying background threat. Um, again, this is one of the sort of key points to again, hopefully sort of allow a bit more proportionality um, across the board. Um, because I, I, in fact, it sort of reminds me that through the process of publishing this guidance, one of the first things that we were keen to do as an author team was um, get a survey out to, the, to as wide an audience as possible about how our response was to the UXO. And so really broadly, the response to that survey was we've got a very polarized response. Either some people are engaging with it and almost getting to the point of eliminating it, like the Australian government example, or conversely, people were ignoring it and not engaging with it at all and sort of was claiming ignorance that it doesn't exist as a hazard. And so, yeah, we, so that, that survey was we thought to key to sort of setting the context for the, the, this new guidance. So yeah, so back on track, the nature of the guide, nature of the hazard, easy to understand. It's an explosion, explosion that occurs with some really uh, significant consequences. It's a very emotive subject, that sort of calls to mind all kinds of different sort of historical and um, historical threads and sort of technical technical threads about sort of contamination profile and other things. Um, it's really engaging and interesting. Each 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 bomb, each bit of ordnance has got a story behind it. Um, so why why is that in the land? Um, and I think this applies to other hazards, other historical hazards that we deal with. So why is that tar pit there? And why is that buried basement on the site? And and so it can really sort of draw you in, uh, which I think can be sort of um, on one hand beneficial, but on the other hand, sort of, yeah, sort of when you've got a day job and a report to get out um, can be um, uh, can can be a bit distracting. Um, again, on, on the uh, the, the emotive side, and that's sort of quite important again, because I think if you, as soon as you start raising the threat of explosions um, and, and 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 threat, it sort of triggers off um, deep within our sort of amygdala. I think the risk of overstretching my knowledge, um, a, a really fight and flight response, and I think that can really feed into the way we respond to this as a, as a hazard. So as I mentioned before, likelihood of encounter, really key point. Um, varies very widely across the UK um, and I mean if we meant to mention Scotland as an example where Glasgow got heavily bombed um, and perhaps some listeners are familiar with this but Edinburgh was being excused um, as and as I understand Hitler sort of liked the city and sort of sought to use it um, as a as a base at some point should should he sort of won the war and so you've got within a country, you've got these hugely varying risk profiles. Um, more broadly, a step back from that, you've got military land where you've got a high frequency of encounter. Um, that there's a figure within C681 of 15,000 items being encountered between 2006 and 2009. Now that figure um, is something that we point out within the new guidance very heavily skewed by the fact on former military land you will find caches of hundreds if not thousands of items of ordnance which will feed into that total and so straight away we need to be able to distinguish between how many of those items of ordnance we're we finding in a former airfield or former munitions depot versus how many we're finding in the city center of Birmingham of Glasgow of Stirling wherever it might be Bombed land is again sort of low frequency of, of encounter, broadly speaking, um, and there's a bit of a note there for current development trends. Um, certainly within London, as one of the highest bomb city, or the highest bomb city in the UK, current development trends are for three-dimensional buildings, deeper basements, taller towers, and so we're going into ground that we haven't dug before, um, and we're coming across items of UXO that have lain undisturbed in there. Um, there's a famous example of the Bermondsey bomb 
um, in uh, east of London, where that bomb was, um, the, the site had been developed after the war, um, and when the site was taken down to a new deeper level, the item was uncovered. And so it's a, it's a rare instance where a passage of time or the development cycle hasn't removed the, the risk, or hadn't removed the hazard there. Um, and so that does happen. As far as I'm aware, that is one of a few examples, but there, I'm sure there are others out there. Again, it's a, trying to focus on the frequency with which this, this takes place. Um, and yeah, so current development is estuarine lands. I mean, we were dealing with the ground, so it's never going to let us get away with being simplistic in its um, in its. Uh, I don't know, it's never it's never going to give it up easily. Um, and so estuarine land is it's going to sit somewhere between the two. Um, I mean, certainly after the Blitz in London, a huge amount of rubble, and I think the same applies to Liverpool as well, was cleared out to the coastal regions. And some of that Blitz rubble was contaminated with UXO. And so when that material either gets brought back on or development takes place on that estuarine land, um, then already straight away you've got uh, a sort of hazard there. I would say managing or assessing that risk is very problematic unless you do know which areas were the areas that were um, blitz rubble was deposited um, and finally there the, the zero fatality record it doesn't remove the need for risk assessment and that's really the bit I think if the main take home from today's talk and our gut and the new guidance is we need we need people to engage with this as a, as a risk um, and we need, we need people to do that in a proportionate way um, and we need to bring more non-specialists into the subject area we really hope to do that with the guidance. The final point there, there's a 10 to 15 percent um, is a figure that's used for the number of aerial dropped munitions during the Second World War that failed to function as intended. Um, that figure, and you've seen this chart, feeds into one element of the, the profile. So this schematic, again, straight from the guidance, is showing you from left to right how you've got the total number of bombs dropped, which this is that little note there says is, is close to what the bomb mapping will illustrate. Um, it's, it's not exactly, but it's close to. Then the wartime hazard um, is reduced because there, there was a number that failed to function, that didn't explode. Um, following on from that, there was a number that were cleared, um, very active clearance operations after the war. Um, unlike in Germany, there's another sort of where you can't you can't draw comparisons with Germany. Um, Germany was in a defensive position. They couldn't do clearance operations and 20 times more munitions were dropped of a different type and nature compared to the ones in the UK. Um, and so again, we, we were in a position where we could do clearance operations during and after the war. And then finally, the, the present day residual hazard, as it's called, um, is the number that remained after post-war development cycles. And this is all obviously relative numbers here, but um, particularly when you get presented with a, a bomb map, um, and there's some very good resources out there. One that the University of Plymouth pulled together, um, I think bomb site uh, that looks at London, and there's one for Liverpool as well that I know of. And it, you can see all the the UXO on a map, and it and it builds a picture of a, a very sort of prevalent threat. Um, whereas when you actually screen through that, um, it's a it's a different picture. Yeah, the practical focus, and um, this is uh, the full flow chart, top left, um, which is severely legible. Moving on to the slightly more blown up box, um, this is really where we're trying to kind of get the focus of any risk management um, is brought into what's top right, the hazard screen step of the process. And th this was built into the C681 um, risk management flow chart. Th th this flow chart is consistent with C681. What we've, we've done is really tried to distinguish between screening for a hazard and assessing it. And so this is something that we're used to doing, for example, for mining risk. Is there a mine shaft on my site? Is there not? Is there shallow workings? Is there not? If there's not, and you're outside of the coalfield region, for example, then that is not something, that you, it's not a hazard that you need to be considering. We're trying to get the, the same applied to the UXO again. So if you're on a former military land, the top bubble there, you, you, you go through, you, it escalates very quickly because the frequency of encountering the UXO is much greater there. You'd be most likely involving specialists in, in your work. If there's indicators of bombing, again, similarly, if you've, if you've, if you've got none, if you're in a, 
um, in, a, in a city with, with no history of bombing, um, then and or rather your, the site within a within a city, even where it was bombed, there's, there's no clear indications of bombing having taken place on that site. Um, then straight away your risk profile is reduced, and you can come out of the process um, where you have got indicators of bombing on or adjacent to your site. You, you're going to be assessing the risk, and so that takes you on that bottom photo image there down into the risk assessment process um, because there's a potential for that hazard to be there. And hopefully you'll see through that so emphasis on that early stage that a lot of a lot of sites do drop out um, or drop in to the process. Um, and I think again with as with any risk assessment, those early stages are key. Um, and so yeah, practically continue with the practical focus. Um, in C681, there was one page of worked examples for preliminary risk assessment. I think two, if not three of them, resulted in a detailed risk assessment being needed. Um, one of them didn't on a greenfield site in the middle of um, Lincolnshire or somewhere. Um, C685 has got five detailed examples with different plan works. So are you just going in to do some hand pits to look at the foundations of a building or to take some shallow soil samples versus doing wholesale excavation of a site for a new basement, that this fundamentally plays into this risk profile on the likelihood of an encounter rather, which is which is key. Um, and and so again, we, we, we sort of run through those. This is one of the case studies from the guidance, a site in Huddersfield, a city that was bombed. It doesn't quite make it into, it makes into the bomb census data, but it, it's, it's not often cited as a city that was bombed significantly. Um, so in our minds already, we've, we're, we're building a picture of of, of a, a city that has got a legacy, um, but one which is because it's formerly bomb land and, and it wasn't that heavily bombed. So it's, it's coming down in our um, in, in our minds. And when we look at two particular sites, this is I should add this is pre and post war mapping, um, historical mapping. If we're looking at a site top top left there, we're seeing that the building arrangements are staying unchanged, um, both on the site and immediately adjacent to it. And there's, there's no, no significant changes to the, the building arrangements. Conversely, if you look at the site over to the, to the right hand side there, um, where you've got a ruin immediately adjacent to the site, which is barely legible, but there's, t there's two ruins next to, the, to, the, to that square and an area of land clearance. Straight away, there's indicators that UXO has landed on or nearby that site. And so through the guidance, the first site there, um, we'd suggest um, that that isn't escalated to a risk assessment stage, whereas this site would be. Um, and so already again, there's like an extra level of granularity to the process. And again, it's just a comparison of the two. Uh, yeah, again, a, a, a point that um, can't be laboured enough, um, and you've probably heard countless times, but there are live documents. Um, I know once you've submitted the report and so clients come back and said they're happy with it and kind of thing, but that, that's done and dusted. But if and where any other additional information, and particularly with UXO, um, I've personally found working with excavator drivers who've known the local area and have said, oh yeah, my grandfather knew about this or my grandmother sort of lived through the blitz, whatever, that they can feed in um, often sort of local knowledge that can have real relevance to, to the risk assessment process. And finally, um, your future work ideas, 10 years from the future, uh, 2029, we're going to get some new guidance. That's Syria's um, work cycle, that they review their guidance on a 10 yearly basis, um, which is just kind of part and parcel of the reason why we got this new guidance, but, but also because there was a polarised response to the risk. Um, the top one, their ageing studies, that's um, again a hyperlink to um, some studies done by um, at the Geneva International Convention of um, Demining. Um, Demining is also a term that's used in international terms for all UXO. And and, and that's, um, yeah, sort of, it's, it's, it's really interesting work. Um, I mean, UXO fuses and gains and boosters, all the things that feed into set that explosive off do degrade with time. Um, that said, the UXO will contain explosive material that can extrude from itself. I'm going into a level of detail that's not, that's not needed on a non-specialist basis, but um, the, the overall trend from some of that research is 
that the risk profile is from the autumn items themselves is diminishing the time. But it, again, it comes back to that key point that we, you can't, as a non-specialist, take take that view. And so you have to treat any suspected item with this with the same level of respect and caution as you would something that's live. Um, and the second point there, destination modeling with that little graphic on the right hand side that I just grabbed from offline. I think it's a nuclear bomb testing. Um, but um, again, I mean, uh, whether or not this would actually uh, benefit the sector or, or, or not, I don't know. It's, this is ideas I'm putting out there. But after a certain point, an explosive charge will, will not um, escape at the surface if it went off in a fully sealed environment. Um, and so um, quite quite how, how, how far that feeds into the construction cycle in a beneficial way, I don't know. Um, and then the, the more information point there, um, it, the guidance is shortlisted for a very competitive um, award in the Brownfield Festival at the minute. And the link there, uh, it takes you to, uh, to the submission if you want to read a bit more in the background of the, of the guidance. And I think that's that's about it. Um, and so if, I really welcome any questions anyone's got. That's great. Thanks very much, Russell. Um, and just before I stop recording, I'll say um, for those that don't know, um, Sclaff are also nominated in the um, as a shortlister for the Brownfield um, Awards this year. So, yeah, if you follow that link, you should be able to find Sclaff on there as well for the work that they did with the Grow 72 Community Project um, last year. Um, so thanks very much, Russell. Um, that was great. Um, we're going to do some Q&A now, but I'm just going to stop the recording first.